if they belong, or what is the context of their story, of their uh, ultimate meaning, okay? And so I thought that even a technological society, before being experienced sociologically as the result of the advances of technology and social changes, was a philosophical development, okay? It was a change in the way of conceiving oneself, ourselves. Not only that, he also said that this philosophical change was taking place historically, okay? Because it doesn't happen in a vacuum. It was a result of the European history of the 20th century. 20th century. And so the Noche tried to explain how is this coming about. And here, an important distinction is that the distinction between the ancestry and the birth of the technocratic society. Because, you know, it's very common to analyze the ancestry of the technocratic society, which is to some extent what Michael was talking about, you know. Immediately, the technocratic society is a rehash, philosophically, of 19th century positives of Kant and uh, Spencer and uh, what's that again? No, uh, Saint Simon and whatever. And then you can push that back in time and you can push it back to Bacon and Descartes. And this is done many, many times. You know, it was done by many great philosophers. And it's perfectly correct and very important. And then ultimately, they, you know, the, the Catholic tradition of the 19th century ended up always with William of Ockham. <laughs> At the end of the day, it's always the fault of medieval nominalism. Okay? Medieval, in, in, in the United States, you had a famous book by a guy named Richard Weaver. I don't know if you are familiar with Richard Weaver. That, and now, oversimplifying, basically traces back this major historical disaster all the way back to nominalism and its developments through the Reformation. There was a book by Brad Gregory a couple of years ago, and then Descartes, and Bacon, and the Enlightenment, and the Positivists. And finally, at the bottom of the heap, there is us, where everything has fallen apart, and finally, <laughs> you know, the, the situation has become completely disastrous. Now, the Noche is not happy with that, because we think that by, by accepting this the catastrophic decline, we are buying into modernity. We are buying into the narrative of modernity. We are just giving it a negative value, right? Modernity has the same story, except it thinks it's great. We accept the story of modernity, and we say, it's a disaster, okay? So the Noche is not very happy with this long time uh, monotonic, <coughs> mechanical development picture. But on the other hand, the notion also thinks that ancestry is not the same as birth. Okay? Because, you know what I mean, if I, if I give you all my ancestors, that doesn't explain me. I'm here not because all my ancestors existed, because my mom and my dad meet at a Christmas party in 1964. <laughs> you see the difference? I mean, there is, a, there is a big difference between what brings something along and all the antecedent factors that existed before what came along. And, and this is important also for practical purposes, because if you just believe that our situation is this unavoidable long-term effect of this long history of rationalism and the development of rationalism through history until it came to us, what do you do? You try to convince people that nominalism is wrong? I mean, it, 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 the notion thinks that we need to do that, okay? We need to know the ancestry. We, know what, we need to know where this is coming from. But we also need to understand how it was born historically. And the Noche believed that this was born historically after World War II for some specific reasons. And if you don't understand the specific reason that triggered this birth of the baby after World War II, we, we may know all the answers back to Noah, but we still, don't understand, we still are kind of helpless in criticizing. Also because the Noche believes that the way this came around, we, the way, the, the, basically there are two factors. Okay? The Noche attributes the birth of the technology society to two factors. One factor is a wrong narrative of modernism, okay? Because you remember that in the, in, in the 1930s, the West faced, the Western culture, European culture, faced the greatest crisis ever. There was first the Bolshevik Revolution that completely threatened Western society at its roots with communism, and as a response, there was Nazism and fascism, and that ended up in a huge bloodbath. In the 1950s, according to the notion, the answer of the Western intellectual class was that this was an anti-modern phenomenon that basically Nazis and fascists and communists were this kind of romantic, irrational, anti-modern phenomenon. And that the way to exercise this was to go back to the Enlightenment, okay? Go back to the myth of modernity as scientific progress and technology, okay? So in his opinion, this is completely wrong, because in his opinion, communism and fascism and Nazis were modern phenomena, not anti-modern phenomena. In fact, they were in some sense a result of the Enlightenment. Okay? And so the way they, they need to be criticized as such. On the other hand, if you go back to the Enlightenment, you're going in a sense to recreate the same, it's like Groundhog Day. Okay? You're, you're going to, to start the same phenomenon again and again. 
So this was the first explanation they gave. In his opinion, after World War II, as a reaction to the tragedy of the 20th century, the West tried to go back to the Enlightenment, to this, the, the worst myth of progress, science, the Condorcet, all that crazy people from the 17th century, from the 18th, 18th century, as an attempt to exercise the, 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 the 20th century, so to speak. The other explanation he gave for the birth of the technology society was the fight against the Soviet Union. He said that in the first 10 years after World War II, people thought that you have to resist the, World War, the Soviet Union in the name of European Christian tradition. But by 1955, in his analysis, this was completely set aside. And the idea is that we are going to beat the Soviets on the ground of greater secularity, of being more modern, more advanced, more scientific, more technological. We are going to show them. Because remember that Marx in himself was a scientist in philosopher. The Soviet Union was the greatest scientific enterprise, and I had one of the greatest scientific technological machines in the history of the world. It really was a science-oriented society in many ways. And the West, the idea was, let's beat them at their own game. Let's beat them at, so we can be more secular, but in a democratic, capitalistic, progressive way, and, in, and so we can respond to communism. This was the idea of the West. The notion stress, uh, stresses very much that the idea of the West is completely different from the idea of Europe. Because the idea of Europe was, in a sense, a synthesis of East and West, of the contemplative and the technical. It was an attempt to keep together, in a synthesis, the two aspects of contemplation and of doing. As I said, after World War II, the idea of the West, as it was developed, was the idea of purging the East from our culture and becoming fully Western, in the sense that they described before. The Noche puts the symbol of this in the election of JFK, not because they had nothing against JFK, but because in 1960, you know, at the end of the 50s, uh, what was the name of the, the Young Turks? New the, Frontier. The New Frontier, the Eggheads, whatever. For him, was the, was, was a symbol, a political symbol, of this embrace of technologies, of this embrace of the West against the East, where the West was the symbol of freedom, the, the East the symbol of authority. The West was the symbol of pragmatic uh, manipulation. The East was the symbol of, con of passive <coughs> contemplation. Right? These two symbols were set in opposition in order to fight the Cold War. These two things are the factors that brought about the technological society. And I want to stress what I said before. In my opinion, it's important to understand this because you need the big picture, the ninth century picture, but you also need the 50 year picture. Yeah, because we need to understand, because this idea is still with us. One thing that I kind of was impressed by reading the Noche and translating the Noche is that nothing has changed since I was born. I was born in 1965, and by reading these essays from the 60s, all the ideas that we read today in the New York Times, they were there implicitly. It appears by reading an author like the Noche that our culture accepted certain presuppositions that were not there before the war. Because before the war, at least European culture was quite different, it was idealistic, it was Hegelian, it was Marxist, but it was not positivistic and technocratic. These ideas were accepted in the 60s, and then we felt like in a, in a rut, in a ditch, you know, and we didn't move anymore, in a sense. You know, it's like a body that stops moving and maybe starts decomposing, if you wish, you know, so metaphorically speaking. Okay, this was the first point. Now, I have two points. I hope I'm going to I have enough time to make two more points. Yeah. Okay, the other two points are, one is this. The Noche is very clear about the fact that scientism or the technology society and the sexual revolution are the two, are two aspects of the same phenomenon. Okay? Because this is something that people don't understand. People think that the sexual revolution was a revolution in the field of morals, of sex. People started having fun or people got liberated or, or whatever. The Noche emphasizes that this change between 1955 and 1965 manifests itself in the ethical sphere as the sexual revolution. The sexual revolution is the ethical reflex of scientists, and uh, it is the moral of the technocratic society. Okay? The scientific revolution is the moral of the technocratic society. Why? Because the philosophical assumption behind the sexual revolution is that sex or love don't mean anything beyond itself. What I said at the beginning, the positivism, where facts, it's just facts. Sex is just a fact, something you do but it's not meaningful of anything, right? There is no what Rosmini, the great Italian philosopher, called order of being. It's not way when, when in, 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 the, in the sexual act or in marital love, in no way we conform to a universal. Okay? In no way we are conforming to a universal order. 
We are just exercising, following an instinct. We are following, we are doing something. We are having sex, you know, which is a horrible expression if you think of it, you know, because it's something you can have. Okay, so positive, positivism in the sense that also Michael described as this brute fact without profundity is the ideology, the ideology that is expressed in the sexual revolution. There is no theological or symbolical or meta-empirical value. And also the individual, because often sexual revolution is criticized as individualistic. But the, the root of the individualism is that there is no ideal bond. You know, I mean, what, what breaks individuality? If all of us, in a sense, relate ideally to a universal, to some order, to some bond. But if you eliminate any meta-empirical or theological domain, there is only the individual, right? And so this is where, that's where, according to the notion, is the source of the individualism implicit in the sexual revolution. And the only end becomes <coughs> incrementing vitality. What you can do is increment vitality because there is no end. There is no meta end to life. So all you can do is to be more alive, to feel more alive. And in human terms, one of the, the classical ways to feel more alive is sex. You know what I mean? I mean so in, in, the, in this sense, that, that that's the root of the sexual revolution. There is this idea of sexual happiness. That is, uh, we can be happy. If we are going, uh, the sexual revolution is going to make us happy. So this was the, the second point, the link between the advent of the technologized society and the sexual revolution. The third thing that the Nazi emphasizes a lot, which I think also Michael mentioned in terms of when he talked about the absolute nature of this kind of society, is that the technocratic society, according to the Nazi, is totalitarian. Okay? And this has to be understood clearly. When the Nazi talks about totalitarianism, it's not talking about being authoritarian. Now somebody who's a bully who wants to dominate, tell you what to do, you know, the, 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 like Hitler, you know, whatever. To the notion, the key of a totalitarian society is the denial of the universality of reason. The denial of the universality of reason. Well, what does this mean? Well, think of the classical example of totalitarians are like communists or Nazis. In, in Marxism, there is a bourgeois science and there is a proletarian science. There is bourgeois truth and proletarian truth, but there is no universal truth. Truth is what advances the revolution. So it's the truth of one side. The same is in Nazis with to the notion Nazis is a mirror image of Marx, and so there is the Jew and the Aryan. Okay? But generally speaking, there is no universal reason that permits democracy, because you know, demo democracy implies that you have a group of people who share in a universal reason and can dialogue, can talk based on this common logos. If there is no, instead, in, if you deny this common logos, ultimately reason is the reason of your group. Okay? Reason is no longer universal. How does this apply to scientists? The way this applies to scientists is because scientists makes a postulate. The postulate is that the only possible knowledge is what can be verified by everyone. So the only possible knowledge is scientific knowledge. So every other knowledge you may have, because your grandma told you, or because you saw an angel, or because you thought very hard philosophically, is not acceptable. Okay? It has to be ruled out. It does not belong in public discourse. Okay, you, you can see this very well in some of the controversies that, that Michael was mentioning earlier. You know? The universal reason is denied because only scientific reason claims to be reason. And all the other expressions of reason that people have are not acceptable. Okay? Um, the Noche says that then, you, then like, like, there was, like if, if you spoke against the Communist Party, you would say, oh, you're a bourgeois. You say that because you're a bourgeois, not because you have a logic to your argument. Now you're a bigot. Uh, the bigotry, the, the typical accusation on our side is that your argument doesn't deserve to be taken seriously because you are motivated by repressed psychology, repressed sexuality, or religion, or, or whatever reason. But reason is no longer universal. Okay, I will read the passage. It says, an advocate of scientism and a society based on his way of thinking cannot help being totalitarian inasmuch as his conception of science is exclusive of every other form of knowledge and thus of various aspects of reality that are declared to be either unknowable or non-existent, his postulate cannot be the object of any proof. A scientific thinker does not intend to elevate other forms of thought like religion, philosophy, to a higher level, but he simply denies them. Okay? But since he cannot prove his own statement, he must rely on the promise of happy. We're going to become richer and richer. Technology is going to be, get, give us better and better gadgets. Okay? But ultimately, it's an act of the will. <coughs> he said, as a matter of fact, many people do not realize that scientists in the technological society are totalitarian in nature. They say, let science organize the social sphere. There's still the other sphere, interior life, 
in which science has no jurisdiction. This would be true if there was a moral consensus between the proponent of scientists and other people. In fact, however, science includes as essential a form of morality, what I call pleasure principle, or the pure increase of vitality, which is absolutely contradictory with traditional ethics. I will finish by saying that this totalitarian nature of scientism on the technology society for the nature has two consequences. One is the elimination of the person as a relationship with the infinite. The nature has a relationship with the absolute. Father Giussani says as a relationship with the infinite. You know what I mean? Because why? Because the question has been eliminated a priori. Atheism is not the end of a study. Atheism is the postulate of the whole system, right? So since the individual is not relation with the infinite, he has no ground on which to criticize present reality. You cannot criticize the world without the other world, in a sense. And according to the notion, in this sense, the individual is extinguished by the technocratic society precisely because of this radical positivism. And the second thing he says, the other characteristic of this scientific totalitarianism is that politics is absorbed into war. There is no more politics, there is just war. Because as I said before, there is no universal reason. Because there is no universal reason, all you can have is to, in a sense, eliminate, maybe non-violently, but eliminate the other point of view. Because the other point of view cannot be recomprised in any synthesis, because there is no universal reason. I will read one last, uh, passage that I think is very interesting. If this vision is transferred to the field of ethical political relationships, a choice will be made in the name of greater prosperity made possible by science, which will lead to that ban of the questions, ban of the profound questions, even if they're rationally legitimate and necessary, and to that conscious and deliberate obstruction of reason that are the characteristics of totalitarianism, totalitarianism according to Eric Vogelin. German-American philosophy. And then he said, there is this sentence. In every totalitarian system, what starts as persecution of religion mutates into persecution of reason. Okay? Everything that starts as persecution of religion ultimately mutates in persecution of reason. Why? Because religion is the openness to the ultimate reason. Okay? Religion is the asking the questions that are most rational. Okay? The religious questions are the most rational questions. Ultimately, the denial of religion is the denial that you can ask those questions. But then, if you start denying that you can ask religious questions, ultimately, every persecution of reason mutates, sorry, every persecution of religion mutates into a persecution of reason. That's it. <laughs>